Perfect Peace Tower is an outreach ministry of the Perfect Peace Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Pastor Derek C. Noel. We invite your questions, observations, or words of encouragement by visiting our website, perfectpeacebaptistchurch.org, or by our email, which is pastornoel at perfectpeacebaptistchurch.org. We are a listener-supported ministry. Please support us with whatever the Holy Spirit places on your heart by going to our website, perfectpeacebaptistchurch.org. Now, prepare to go deeper into the Word of God with Pastor Derek C. Noel. Well, good evening and welcome to the Perfect Peace Broadcast Ministry Hour. My name is Jesse and I'm sitting in for Pastor Derek C. Noel. Pastor Noel is doing good. Matter of fact, Pastor Noel is doing great. Taking some time off just because he's deserving. He's been doing this for 20 plus years on the Perfect Peace Broadcast Ministry. 20 plus plus years in the perfect peace baptist church he's a servant devoted trusted servant of the lord and he's just taking some time off and the amazing part is he trusts me to sit in this seat and i'm grateful to him but more than him i'm grateful that the lord jesus christ trusts me to speak on his behalf, to use his words, his scripture, to be able to share a message with you tonight. Tonight's message is, this is going to be a three-part, maybe a four-part series, but for sure a three-part series. And the series is going to be entitled, The Time of the End. The Time of the End. Understanding the world as we see the day approaching. And tonight's message is going to be part one. And part one, what we're going to do is we're going to understand the prophetic scriptures. The Bible was replete with scripture. But do you know that over one third of the Bible is prophecy? And because one third of the Bible is prophecy, I would consider that very important that we understand prophecy. Now, tonight, we're not going to attempt to understand prophecy in its entirety. But what we're going to look at is the scriptures that are prophetic to the end times. There's a lot of scripture, uh, some some scriptures that we don't regularly read. Some scriptures may even surprise you that they're prophetic. So we have a lot to begin with tonight. So we're going to open up with prayer. Oh, and after prayer, I have one thing that I have to, two things that I have to share with you before we get into the body of tonight's topic. So let's prepare to go before the throne. This is a moment of reverence. So as we go before the throne, let's quiet our hearts and let's bow our hearts to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus the Christ. And we have that access because what Jesus has done for us. He gave his life as a living sacrifice for us, the propitiation for our sins. And when he hung up on that cross and died, he said it is finished. What is finished? Death. The power of sin over us. And all we have to do is accept his sacrifice, believe in him, and we have been removed from the guilt and penalty of sin. And we have access to you because the veil in the temple was, re re was ripped and that 
old sacrificial system was done with where we don't need a priest to come before you and make atonements for our sins but our atonement is done in Christ's sacrifice at the cross and we can come before you boldly before the throne and have access and intimacy and devotion and prayer with you and father how grateful i am that i have that access how grateful i am for what jesus has done for us all father you have given us a task and that task is to share your word is to share what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. So Father, I don't take that lightly because lives are on the line. Souls are dying. Souls need to hear the message. So I ask you, Father, to take this ministry, take this subject, take this message and use it for your purpose and send it forth so that minds can hear Ears can listen and hearts can be changed and turn to Christ Jesus, Lord. That's all it's about and that's all I ask. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you and it's humbling that you will see fit to use me to be able to deliver this message. But I'm thankful, Father. And it's in your name, Jesus, that I ask these blessings. And we say, Amen. Amen. We're going to get started tonight. Now, last week, during the message, I was talking about the RSV, I believe. Is that what it was? The RSV and how I believe that it's just a very, very, very bad translation. And if you have a paper copy of it, to get rid of it. You know, you don't need any translation like that in your house. I, I don't say that about many translations, but the RSV is one translation that I'm definitely not comfortable with. And I don't want you to be comfortable with it if you're using it. Why do you say that, Jesse? Let me share with you why. I'm going to pull up this one scripture, and many of us are very familiar with it. It's the... It's the is in Corinthians, first, first Corinthians, excuse me, chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six. And we're going to read it from both the King James Version. And we're going to read it from the RSV. And I think you'll be able to see the problem is that I have with it. And prayerfully, you'll have a problem with it as well. First Corinthians chapter six. Verse 9. Go with me there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Now, this is the King James Version. But let's start at the RSV. So that prayerfully you'll be able to see why i have such disdain for this translation this is first for, excuse me first corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 and we're reading this from the rsv do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither the immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor sexual perverts. Let's finish with 10 so you can see, the, see it completely. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you're probably saying, okay, Jesse, I don't see anything wrong with that. Why do you have such a disdain for the RSV translation? And why are you telling me to throw it out? Well, let's read it from the King James Version. And then I think you can understand why I'm saying get rid of that translation. We're going to read the same two scripture. 1 Corinthians 
chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Go with me there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 from the King James Version. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Did you catch that? No, seriously, did you catch that? If you didn't, I'm kind of disappointed in you. Let me show you what it is. In the King James Version, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. What is that talking about? The LGBTQ community. You can't misinterpret that. Look at it again. Nor effeminate. That's men who act like women. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's men who have sex with other men. Women who have sex with other women. The homosexual, the LGBTQ community. Why do I have a problem with the RSV? Because that's a homosexual friendly translation. You didn't see that? Let's read it one more time. Let's go back to it one more time in the RSV version. And you'll clearly see that is a perverted translation. The RSV says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither they're moral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor sexual perverts. What in the world does sexual perverts mean? That could mean anything. That could be some type of freaky D. You know, that's not saying anything about a homosexual. That's not saying anything about the LGBTQ. This is a friendly translation for the LGBTQ. And how did I find that? Because I, I barely read other translations anyway i read king james version i read the new living translation i read the amp those are my go-to translations i read the esv those are my four go-to translation i hold the king james version as a very ac accurate translation and that's my go-to translation everything hinges on that if it goes against anything that i find in the king james version then you know i really defer to what the King James Version has to say. I think it was translated, and I think it's God's word carried over forth into English. And the best translation possible is the inerrant word of God and the best translation possible for the English language. So I adhere to it completely. But again, I'm hoping you catch that. And again, how did I catch that? I caught that because I was listening to a program and they were talking about gay friendly bibles you know the gays the homosexuals the lgbtq community they're looking for bibles that don't speak out against their lifestyle nor their activity i was reading some um article one day and you know the, the fun part about reading some articles online is just reading the comments and you know I, some of the comments that just make you pull your hair out and some of the comments that just make you laugh silly i was reading one article i can't remember what it was it was a while back but it had to do with the homosexual agenda and it was um basically talking about uh the, the condemnation of the homosexual lifestyle the lgbtq community lifestyle in in the world and how the bible condemns it and it was one comment under there where the person said do they have any bibles that's gay friendly you know, you might laugh at that, but when you take time and you sit in there and think about it, that's not the only person that's thinking like that. So if they don't have those type of Bibles, what do they do? They end up making those type of Bibles or they find translations that refuse 
to acknowledge that lifestyle like the RSV. So to not be belabor the point, the RSV is a perverted translation. I don't care what the rest of it says in there because I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to read it solely for the fact that 1 Corinthians 6, 9, a lot of people like to say, well, they don't condemn homosexuality in the New Testament. Yes, 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 they do. Romans 1. Romans 1 is the principal one that condemns it. Romans 1, in addition to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, condemns it. 2 Timothy condemns it. There's a lot of New Testament scriptures that condemns it. So, you know, when you start to see these type of things where they soften the language and give you that ambiguous language that can mean anything you have to be very careful because that's how scripture gets lost that's how scripture gets misinterpreted that's how scripture gets watered down hebrews 13 tells us jesus christ the same yesterday today and forever christ doesn't change so his word doesn't change we are not to be the one to attempt to change his words. Amen? Amen. Another thing I want to share with you before we get started tonight is it, this very disturbing news article. Very disturbing news article. And it happened in Philadelphia this week. And I'm only sharing with you this with you because, again, we're watch, watchmen on the wall. And we're supposed to be able to relate to you the times that we're in. And nothing does it better than news articles. But if you haven't seen this, this is very disturbing. And I'm giving you warning now. This is very disturbing. So if you're disturbed by images, I'm going to ask you to turn away now and just listen to the reading. Police released disturbing footage of Philadelphia parking officer shot in the head in broad daylight. And also, before we get into the article, I have to make a disclaimer to you, YouTube, because YouTube wants to take videos like this down, talking about they condemn violence. No, how can you condemn violence when this is news that's showing you what's going on in the world? This is not violence. This is a news reporting subject. And we're reporting news. We're not condoning violence. We're not condoning shootings or anything like that. We're sharing the news. So YouTube, take notice that this is a news article that we're sharing, that the news has shared their self. But let's continue. Police released disturbing footage of Philadelphia parking officer shot in the head in broad daylight. Philadelphia police released graphic surveillance footage showing the moment a Philadelphia parking authority officer was shot and wounded last Friday afternoon. The grisly incident unfolded around 4 p.m. in Philadelphia's Frankfurt neighborhood when a 37-year-old unidentified officer was writing tickets on Frankfurt Avenue near Orthodox Street. CBS News reported the unidentified gunman is seen in a video walking up behind the officer before whipping out a pistol and shooting him at Point Blank range. The officer immediately collapses to the ground, at which point the suspect and a bystander both flee, according to the footage. This is graphic content. Turn your head if you don't want to see this. That's the man at the bottom walking up to the officer at the top. He just walks up behind him for no reason whatsoever. For no reason whatsoever. For no reason whatsoever. That's Romans 1. Right there in your face. They talk about the depravity of man. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3 right there in your face. Right there in the headline. Where they show how the love for men will wax colder and colder. Just had to share that with you again just to show you how depraved this society has become maranatha lord jesus let's get into our subject for tonight the time of the end understanding this world as we see the day approaching now again today what we're going to talk about 
This is going to be a three part series. Part one today, we're going to start to recognize the prophetic end time scriptures. The Bible is replete with prophetic scriptures. So we're going to focus on the end times prophetic scriptures. Many of you are familiar with the, the big ones, the main ones, like Revelation, like 2 Thessalonians, like Thessalonians, like Luke 21, like Matthew 24. Of course, we talk about those all the time. And those are great prophetic scriptures. But you know, there are other scriptures that we don't think of as being end time prophecy that actually are prophecy for the end time. And one of the ones that we, I don't want to say tend to overlook, but we don't really look at it as a fulfillment of end time prophecy. One of the main ones that I like to look at is Genesis. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 is known as the Proto-Evangelium. Proto ah, I tried to say that fast three times. And what that's talking about the birth of Christ. Now, we can't have end time without Christ's birth. This is the first one in Genesis 3.15 that talks about the birth of Christ. Go with me, please, to Genesis 3.15. We're going to read from the King James Version. And it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's our Heavenly Father talking to the serpent, that old serpent, that dragon, Satan, in the Garden of Eden, when his deception and his lies were brought sin into the world because Adam disobeyed God. Adam disobeyed what God had told him to do because he listened to these lies from the, from the enemy, from the serpent, and he ate the fruit. Now, I just want to share with you the biting of the fruit was no magical or mythical thing that brought sin into the world. What brought sin into the world was Adam's disobedient not to eat the fruit of the tree. Not to eat the fruit of the tree. That's what brought sin into the world. He disobeyed God. And when he bit that fruit, the curse came and sin entered into the world. So Genesis 3.15 is a very, very important end-time scripture, end-time prophecy. Let's read it one more time. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What that's telling you there is Christ is going to be born, and he's going to come into this world, and he's going to suffer. He's going to suffer because of all of the evil, because of all of the destruction that the demon Satan, the devil Satan is doing. That's what's going to bruise his heel. But our Lord Jesus is going to crush that serpent's head. And he did at the cross. Oh, death, where's thy sting? Christ took the victory over death and the victory over sin on his sacrifice on the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. But we have many more prophetic scriptures. And it's, and it's important to understand where these prophecies come from so that we can one day eventually tie them all together. And that's what Pastor has been doing lately. He's had a series where he's been talking about the rapture and he's been bringing a lot of these scriptures together. But there's other scriptures that I just want to share with you so that we can get a well rounded picture of prophecy and how to read scripture so that we can understand and so that we can share with others the times that we're in. Because one of the best ways to be able to share the times is by able to be able to point to the Bible and show that the Bible foretold millennia ago that the things we see now are going to happen. When you have something that says something was going to happen 
and then you look at it and be like, wow, this is really happening. That gives it authenticity. That gives something where you can have tangible facts to check it and see like, wow, this said this when and this is happening now. You know, now you have something you can point to as proof. And the Bible is full of truth. And our Lord is full of truth and grace. We have another scripture. And as many of you know, we find that in Daniel. Daniel is one of the leading books in the Bible that speaks of prophecy. Daniel foretold the four kingdoms that would arise back in the ancient days, back in the days of when these great kingdoms started to arise. He foretold the four kingdoms that was going to arise. But you know what is often missed in Daniel? What's often missed in Daniel is Daniel actually told about the fifth kingdom that was going to rise, the kingdom of the Antichrist. We don't talk about that too often because most of us, when I say most of us, I'm talking about the end times theologian. We talk about the four kingdoms and then we point to the four kingdoms as proof that the Bible is accurate because the Daniel foretold of the four kingdoms that were going to rise back in antiquity. What did we have? We had the um, Babylonian Empire, followed by the um, Medes and the Persian Empire, followed by the Grecian Empire, followed by the Roman Empire. What's missed a lot of times is in Daniel 7, where 7 and 8, where it talks about that fifth empire that's going to rise, that empire that's going to rise during the rise of the Antichrist, during the time of the tribulation. We can read that. Go with me, please. Let's read um, some of Daniel chapter 7, and let's just start to, you know, get a grasp of how we find different scripture and how it's prophetic to the end time. So go with me, please. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 7, and we're just going to read some of it and see if we can get some of the things, glean some of the things out of it. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld, beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said this thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the root. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. I beheld then, because the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. And concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven 
and came to the Ancient of Days. They, they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. And I'm pretty sure that scripture that we just read, Daniel 1, Daniel 7, chapter 1 to 15, are probably having you grieved in your spirit, in the midst of your body, for the visions that were in Daniel's head that troubled him. They're probably troubling you because you're saying, what did all of that say? What all that did was just tell you what was going to take place. And they're talking about the horns and the beasts. And all of that, I know you probably get this imagery in your head of these creatures, but no, it's simpler than that. Because the great thing about Daniel and why I say Daniel is one of the most prophetic books and one of the more interesting books that you have to read to understand prophecy is the great thing about Daniel is scripture interprets itself. You don't believe me? Just wait. Don't believe me? Just watch. Let's, let's finish in Daniel 7.15 and let's see. Uh, what happens when this interpreting angel comes and tells Daniel of what these visions were about. That's the beauty of scripture. That's the reason why it's so important to have to read Daniel because Daniel gives you these interpretations of what these things like the beast, what these things like the horn, what these things like mountains mean, what these things like the sea mean. And see, you see these same words used in other prophetic texts like Zechariah, like Matthew, like Revelation, like 2 Timothy. You see these words and now you're able to put it together. Oh, that's what it was saying in Daniel. This is what it meant in Daniel. But this is what it meant in Revelation. This is what it meant in Thessalonians. This is what our Lord was talking about in Matthew. And in this is the understanding we get from Zechariah chapter 12, chapter 14. Let's continue with Daniel and you'll see as we listen to what the interpreting angel tells Daniel. We left off at verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. Now this, this part is important because these are the interpretations of the visions that Daniel saw that apply to Daniel's dream, but applies to other prophetic scriptures as dealing with the end time. So let's see what we can glean from this. Again, verse 16 says, I came near unto one of them that stood by, one of them meaning the interpreting angel, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. You see that? The beasts are four kings. Which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Are you starting to see this now? Then I would know the truth of the four. Oops, I went too far. No, I didn't. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth, fourth, be, fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell. Now, as we start to go through this series, you're going to see that in verse 20, it's talking about the Antichrist that's going to come in the kingdom of the tribulation and the rise of the tribulation period. The saints will be gone, but that beast with the little horn, 
that's talking about the Antichrist. And we'll get to that. We'll show you that in the other prophetic scriptures. But I did want to just point that out right now. Let's see that and read that again. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Read about that in Revelation. Um, what is that? Uh, 13, I believe, when the rise of the Antichrist. But let's continue. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change the times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years. That's, you find that again replete in Thessalonians, you find that replete. In Revelation, where they talk about the three and a half year period, and that's going to be the great tribulation that's spoken of by Christ in Matthew 24. And when you get an understanding of these things as you read them in Daniel, you'll have a better understanding of these things as you read them in other parts of the scripture. Remember, Daniel interprets these signs these words, these events that we see in other scriptures. So when we read other scripture, we can come to Daniel, get an understanding of what these things are telling us. But let's finish. But the judgments shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Find that in Revelation. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Did you hear about the coming kingdom of Christ after the tribulation period? going to be eternal forever and forever. Hallelujah. If that doesn't give you reason to shout, if that doesn't give you reason of joy, you don't know Jesus and you need to know Jesus. And I'm sorry, I got a little text message. Hey, hey, Frosty, how you doing? Always a pleasure to see you, sir. I should make you just jump for joy. And then Daniel again goes on and we find some more interpretation in Daniel chapter nine. And we have the things that's going on in chapter nine that helps us interpret of the scripture as we go forward. So go with me, please, to Daniel chapter nine. And we're going to read the first couple of verses in Daniel nine. Now, the one thing that you need to understand when you read Daniel is Daniel is not linear as most of the Bible is. And, you know, it took me a while to understand it because when I first started reading Daniel, you know, I would get kind of mis confused, misguided, mis confused because, you know, I'm a linear thinker. You know, I think of things just, you know, on a straight path. It's hard for me to just, you know, jump around the place because then I, you know, don't grasp the understanding as well when things do this. But, you know, just so you understand, Daniel is not linear. It goes for. So when you read it, understand the chapters 
don't follow in a straight line. They're different time periods. Like, in, for instance, Daniel chapter 5 happens, I think, before chapter 6. Don't hold me to that. Let me see. Daniel chapter 6 is when um, Darius comes. So Daniel chapter 5. But ne nevertheless, it's not linear. And what I want to show you is we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about how Scripture interprets Scripture. And we're showing you the prophetic Scripture so we can understand, get a better grasp of what's going on. In end times prophecy, Daniel chapter nine, and I'm reading from the King James Version. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is a great prophetic book as well. And Jeremiah has a lot of prophecies about what's going to happen to Israel. But you do find some prophecies at the end times in Jeremiah. If I believe Jeremiah 33, where it talks about Jerusalem is going to become a cup, a trembling, a burdensome stone. But let's finish. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, now this is Daniel's prayer. This prayer goes on for like 21 verses, 19 verses. O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandment. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgment. Kind of sounds like America, doesn't it? Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs unto you, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near and that are far off to all the countries whether thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongs confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongs mercies and forgiveness. Forgivenesses. But we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven have not been done as have been done upon Jerusalem. And it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet may we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he does. For we obey not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renowned, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, According to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. 
O my God, incline thy ear and hear. Open thy eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. But we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Wow, there's a lot going on in there. Did you hear Daniel's prayer? Did you hear Daniel pour out his heart to the Lord? Did you hear Daniel confess how much the people that sinned, how much they had turned? their backs to God, how they had turned their faces from God and just sinned completely against him. What did Daniel do? Daniel went to him in prayer, seeking his face, seeking his forgiveness. That should give us some ideas what we need to do. We need to pray for this land because this land, America, we're headed for judgment. You look around. Everything is perverted now. Everything is perverse. They curse God in his face in America. They shake their fists at him. They want nothing to do with the creator of heaven and earth. They want nothing to do with the person who has given them life. Same thing that was happening in Jerusalem. Her, Daniel said, how he bought them out of Egypt with his mighty hand and he gained great now. God has shown himself, the people of Israel, who he is. They turned their backs on him. And you saw what happened to the people of Israel. You see what's happening to them now because of their rebellion. No, this is not a statement on Kanye West. This is not a statement as Kanye West. This is a statement on the Bible. The Jews are still God's people. God is going to call all the Jews home and they're going to acknowledge and confess in Christ Jesus the Lord. Scripture tells you that. You say it's only found in the New Testament. No, you read the Old Testament. Isaiah 53 talks about Christ, what he's going to do. Find it in Jeremiah. We just read some of it in Daniel. why these things are happening. But let's continue with Daniel. Daniel 24 is where the prophecy and the interpretation of end time prophecy comes into place. Now this one is, is not really easy to glean, but when you read it over and again, right now we're not really trying to glean this. We're trying to find the places where we can go in scripture and find places to help us understand other parts of scripture, especially end time scripture. Daniel 9 Chapter 9, verses 27 through 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, this is the angel Gabriel who's talking to Daniel now after Daniel's long prayer, confessing how his people in Israel and himself included had turned their backs on God. Daniel was a servant of the Lord. So they must, don't misunderstand me. When I say it turned his back, Daniel still sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Daniel had faith. Daniel was a servant of the Lord. And all the saints will see Daniel in heaven in eternity. But what I'm saying is that Daniel, when he prayed not only for the nation of Israel and them in their captivity, because Daniel knew that the time was coming for the 70 years to be up for them to finally leave out of the captivity of Babylon and go home to the pleasant land known as Jerusalem. Jeremiah 
the scripture that we always hold to that a lot of the Christians, we like to claim for ourselves. Look, we get many of the promises, but Jeremiah 29, 11 is a strict promise for the Jews. How do I know that? Because Jeremiah 29, 11 is talking about the Jews going into captivity for 70 years. Read it. Read Jeremiah 29 yourself. We're not, that wasn't one I had on the list, so I don't want to be able to go there right now because we're getting close to that time. But read Jeremiah 29 and you specifically expressly see the Lord talk about the 70 years that Israel was going to be captivity in Babylonia. And this is the prayer that Daniel is talking about. This is the prayer that Daniel is praying when he's praying in chapter 9. He's praying because he knows that it's about time for those 70 years to be up. But there's a catch. There's this thing in there that's called Daniel's 70th week. One of the biggest parts of prophecy that many people don't understand nor appreciate because what's amazing about Daniel's 70th week, we're going to read about the 70 weeks that the interpreting angel is going to tell Daniel about in one second. But what's so amazing about Daniel's 70th week, that's the period of the tribulation. That 70th week has not come yet. That 70th week is going to be a seven-year period that's spoken of at the end of time, the tribulation, when the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. And the Jews are called back home. 144,000 are going to witness. The Jews are going to accept Lord Jesus as their Savior. Amen. Amen. But let's read Daniel 9 so we can start to get a little glean of these scriptures and how scripture interprets scriptures. This is the interpreting angel Gabriel that we read about in verse 20, 21, 23, 21, 22, 23 of Daniel chapter 9. And he says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Finish the transgression and to make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That covenant with many for one week is what I say starts the tribulation period because we have a set definitive term of seven years. That covenant with many for one week, one week means seven years. And in that one week, we read right here, we have two three and a half year periods. Let's read that right now. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, that's three and a half years. He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's when the Antichrist goes into the temple and desecrates the temple and he claims himself to be God. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Now, that's a lot to take in, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Those four verses right there pretty much tell you about the end time period, and especially in verse 27. It's telling you exactly what's going to happen in the end time, right during the tribulation, right during that seven year period when the wrath of God is poured out upon the earth. Right in that period, the second three and a half that Christ talks about in Matthew chapter 24. And that's the interpreting angel, because remember, in verse, what was that, 23? In Daniel, where he was talking about, let, I'm going to make known to you what these matters are. That was the interpreting angel Gabriel making known to Daniel these visions that he saw in his head. He was interpreting for him these things that Daniel saw. 
and we can go to Daniel's to get a better understanding of these things that we're going to see in the future. Amen. Amen. But let's continue because we have some more scriptures that are leading to prophetic time. And if you would, Daniel 12 is another interesting one. Very interesting because it talks, it speaks on the end times as well. Daniel 21, Daniel 12, excuse me, chapter 1 says, and at that time shall Michael stand up. Now, I didn't want to go, and it's probably more important that we do read about um, Daniel 11, but Daniel 11 is one of those chapters that you have to actually do a study in because Daniel 11 takes us through all the things that has happened and takes us into some of the things that's going to happen. It starts to talk about the Antichrist. It starts to talk about the periods of tribulation and uh, destruction of Jerusalem. It takes you through all that. It takes you through a period of history all within that one chapter. It takes you through history and it's amazing, but it requires a study to understand it because you start to talk about the king of the north and the king of the south. And, you know, when you read it, it starts to jumble itself all together in your mind. And you're trying to say, what is this saying? What is this saying? I don't get it. So that's the only reason why I didn't take you to Daniel 11. But one day we're going to go through that. I'm going to I'm sure pastor, I'm going to try to convince pastor to go through Daniel 11 so we can see history actually unfolding right before us. And actually be able to point to it. Wow, this did happen. But for the sake, I'm explaining this to you for the sake that we can um, just jump right into Daniel 12 and see some of the prophetic language that we read in other scripture today. So right here where we see at that time, right, it's jumping straight in from chapter 11. After it has said all these other things that's going to happen. Now we get to this time where it says... And at that time shall Michael stand up. Michael is an arch, archangel, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. Michael is the archangel for the people of Israel. We read that right there. We get this right here. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even as to that time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. We're in that time right now. We see the increase of knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said, the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. That's three and a half years. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up, sealed, till the time of the end. Words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And those words are starting to open now. That's why we can better understand scripture now because we can look at the things that were foretold millennia ago and we can look back and see what scripture was telling us what's going to happen in our times that we're facing now. Amen. We have a myriad of other scriptures that I do want to get to tonight. Uh, we'll probably have to finish most of this up tomorrow, but I do want to share with you Zechariah 12 and show you how that's a prophetic. Zechariah is a very prophetic in time book. And we have to read Zechariah in the context of what is meant. Zechariah almost, if you, when you read Zechariah, 
it's the whole Bible. You know, it goes back to the end and it goes all the way to the end. It goes back to the beginning and it goes all the way to the end. It's just a whole prophetic book and you should read it, especially once you get to Zechariah 4. From Zechariah 4 to Zechariah 14, it's just mostly prophecy. And I highly recommend that you read that on your own. But I do want to just show you these scriptures just so you can have some familiarity with them and how they relate to the end times. The burden of the word. This is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem burden some stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, so all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Don't we see that now? Don't we see that happening now? How everybody is going against Jerusalem? How everybody is going against Israel? And how they're trying to get that two-state solution going? It's amazing. But let's continue. Verse 4 tells us, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and I will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength, and the Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an earth, a fire among the woods, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David, and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Wow. Did you get all that? Did you get all of these things that's coming upon the children of Israel, that's coming upon Jerusalem? Did you get that Christ is going to be crowned their king there? They're going to look upon him whom they've pierced. They shall mourn him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Prophetic scriptures that relate to the end time. We have one more. Zechariah 14. This is a real key verse. Zachar real key chapter. Zechariah 14 tells us, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the horses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the mist thereof toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, half of it toward the south. And ye shall 
flee to the valley of the mountain, for the valley of the mountain shall reach into Isaiah. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light, and it shall be day in the city, and it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from the Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, um, Dead Sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Talking about when the Lord returns. Talking about prophecy in time. These are key verses that we have to familiarize ourselves with. And when we familiarize ourselves with these prophecy, it helps us understand not only what's taking place now, but what's going to take place in the times to come. I have a myriad of more scriptures. I'm going to let you read these for yourselves because our time is just about up. I will place these in the description of this video after this video end. But I did want you to know about and read about Isaiah 53. I'm going to put these on the screen so you can see them. Isaiah 53. You should read that because it talks about our Lord Jesus. You need to understand that. Ezekiel 38. It talks about that great coming war. Battle of Gog and Magog. Isaiah 39. It tells us what's going to happen those who come against Jerusalem in that battle of Gog and Magog. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us about when we're raptured out of here, what's going to take place. 2 Th Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 tells us about the perilous times and the end time. This one I just Got to show you some more. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Don't you see these things happening now? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, petty, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Verse 13 says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Wow. Second Timothy verse four. Second Timothy chapter four, verse three and four. For the time will come when they will endure sound when, when they will not, excuse me, endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Luke twenty one, Matthew twenty four. Jude, the entire book of Jude, Second Peter, Second Peter talks about people, the scoffers who don't believe about the end times, nor Christ, nor his coming. Those are all prophetic scriptures that talk about the end time. And I thought it was important. And there's plenty more. But these are like, I don't want to just use the word major, but these are like some of the ones that really help us get a better understanding 
of what's going to happen in the end time. What's happening in these times right now? What's happening in these times right now? But don't be afraid. Don't fear. Take joy in what you see happening. These are the most exciting times in the history of Earth. And guess what? You get to live in them. You get to share Christ Jesus. And you have something tangible to point everybody to. The Bible, his word. Open it up in the darkest when the light shines the brightest. We are the light of the world because of Christ Jesus. Let our light so shine that they will give our Father in heaven all the glory. How do we do that? By sharing the good news of Christ Jesus, risen Savior. He loves you. He gave his life. He came from heaven to die for you. The creator, heaven and earth of everything. Think about that for a minute. Let that sit on your head for one second. The creator of heaven and earth. Your creator loves you so much that because we cannot save ourselves from sin, I always leave that out because a lot of people may ask the question, save myself from what? From the penalty and the punishment of sin. Nothing we do. We cannot keep any rules. We cannot keep a law. We cannot be good. We cannot be righteous. The only thing we can do is accept Christ Jesus. And he came to earth to do that. He looked down and he said, sinful man has no salvation. I'm going to come and save him. First man sinned. And as a result of sin, all inherit sin and the penalty and wages of sin. There's a payment required for sin. The wages the payment for sin is death. Christ came to save us from the penalty, the payment of sin. He, Christ Jesus, paid our penalty for sin. When he got on the cross, gave his life, said it is finished. When he said it was finished, he wasn't talking about him. He was saying, the payment in full is complete. That was the end of the story because he was buried. And on the third day, he arose. All power in his hand. And now he is at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool going to return soon and he's going to call out his thanks and he's going to lay out his wrath on all those who have rejected this grace all those who have rejected coming to Christ Jesus you have a choice right now if you're hearing this message right now asking you the most important decision of your life is so important because the decision you make is going to determine where you spend eternity. God made man in his image, as I, as I shared with you last week, God is an eternal being. Yes, he's spirit. He's eternal. He's forever and ever. He's everlasting. We were made in his image that means we have an eternal soul. We're going to live in eternity somewhere. We're either going to live eternity with Christ Jesus in his peacefulness, in his blessed hope, in the joy that he intended for us to have when he first created the heavens and earth. You have to accept Jesus to do that or you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The lake of fire was not prepared for you. The lake of fire was not created for you. The lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels. You're not supposed to go there. God doesn't want you to go there. He's waiting for all those who will 
receive the salvation of Christ, to receive the salvation of Christ. And when that last person receives it, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, we should have read that. When that last person receives it, then he's going to return. And oh boy, when he calls us out of here, the doo-doo is going to hit the fan. Read Revelation 6, chapter, read Revelation chapter 6 through 19, and you see everything that's going to come upon the earth. You don't want to be a part of that. You don't have to be a part of that. You can escape that. Revelation 3.10 tells you that you can escape the day that's coming upon you. You need to heed that. Make a decision not to accept Christ. Not because you're scared, but because you love him and you want to thank him for what he has done for you. What has he done for you? He has given you eternal life. And all you have to do is believe. Nothing else. No more. Believe. Abraham believed and it was counted him as righteous. Abraham is the father of our faith because faith because he believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. He's the example that we have to follow. We believe and when we believe in Christ Jesus, what he has done for us, saved us from our sin, we receive the righteousness of Christ. We're cloaked with the righteousness of Christ. Our sins are gone from us forever. They're separated as far as the east is from the west. God no longer sees our sins. He sees the righteousness of Christ when you accept Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. Do that today. Do that right now. Nothing is promised. Nothing about five minutes from now is promised. The only thing that's promised is that when you accept Christ Jesus, you will be with him in eternity. The other thing that's promised, if you don't accept Jesus, you will be with the devil and his angel in the lake of fire for eternity, where the worm dieth not. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to shake some sense into those who are rejecting this great salvation that the Lord Jesus has given. Accept it today. How do you do that? Open up your heart and you confess your sins. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin. I repent for my sin. I turn away from my sin. I no longer want to live this life of sin. Lord Jesus, you have promised that you will free me from the penalty of my sin. You promise that you will no longer remember my sins. Lord Jesus, I accept your free gift that cost you everything of salvation, Lord. Come into my heart and change me. I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you were buried. I believe that you got up. You were raised on the third day. I believe, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you are who you say you are and that you will do what you say you will do. Come into my heart and save me, Jesus. Turn me around, clean me up from the inside out. And I will live the remainder of this life on this side for you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me so. In your name, I ask these things. Say a prayer like that, something similar like that. Mean it. Don't just think it. Mean it. Have that heart connection and mean it. You are a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When you accept Christ Jesus, you're no longer a sinner. You become a saint and you are entered into the forever family. Do that now. Say that prayer right now and mean it. Ask Holy Spirit to lead you in what it is to say so that you can receive this great gift of salvation found only in our Lord. Don't believe Oprah. There's not many ways to heaven. John 14 tells us, I am the truth. Talking, This is Jesus talking. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. No man comes into the Father except by me. That's Jesus talking. There's only one way to the Father. Jesus tells you. 
through him. That's the only way to get to heaven. Don't believe the rest of those stories, those lies. Trust God. And if you, if you prayed that prayer just now with me, I welcome you to the forever family. You have salvation. It can never be taken away from you because it's reserved for you in heaven. You don't hold that. The Lord is holding that in earnest in heaven right now till the day of his return. But have eternal life. Right now, the moment, accept Christ. Get you a Bible. Don't know the Lord. If you're just new to the Lord, get you a Bible. Have many of those on your phone. Get you a Bible. Download you an app. Get you a paper Bible. Read the King James Version. Listen, I know it's difficult. It's difficult reading. Read it. Try, yeah, try to understand. Holy Spirit will open it up to you. Get you what I call a devotional translation like the New Living Translation or the AMP or the ESV. Read those alongside with the King James to help the King James be opened up to you. When I say the King James is a better translation, it is. And once you start to know the Bible, if you don't read the Bible already, you will understand why the King James Version is a better translation. Get you a Bible believing church home. It's important for us to come together and to encourage one another, to uplift one another, to worship together and glorify the Lord. You know, we're going to be doing that in eternity. Do you know that? That's what it tells us in Revelation. We're going to be worshiping the Lord for eternity. No, it's not going to be a big church service. You're going to live your life because you're going to want to worship the Lord. You're going to want to just sit there and praise him. Thank him for all that he has done for us. And we're going to have a wonderful time. The Bible tells us it's important for us to come together. In Hebrews 10, as we see that day approaching. It's important for us to come together. That's why you have to get you a church home. Don't stay home and watch it on YouTube. Don't stay home and watch it on Facebook. Listen, if you can't get out, I understand that. But if you can't get out, get amongst other believers of Christ and let's build each other up so we can have the strength and courage to go out here and just share Jesus with us and pray every day, every day, every moment of the day. Pray without ceasing. You don't have to be on your knees to pray. Wherever you're at, you can pray. You can be standing in the bank club. Ask the Lord, Lord, help me hurry up and get out this line. Listen. I say that in jest, but you gotta have, you gotta have, you gotta have, you gotta have fun in the Lord. Pray all the time. Pray. Praying is talking to the Lord. Pray every day and read your Bible every day. Thank you for inviting us, the Perfect Peace Broadcast Ministry, into your home tonight. My name is Jesse. I love you. I'll see you next week. We're going to start on part two. Part two is, uh, what is part two? Learning how to survive in a godless society. That's what we're going to talk about next week. Thank you for inviting us into your home. God bless, and we'll see you soon. To give unto every man a The Perfect Peace Tower is an outreach ministry of the Perfect Peace Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Pastor Derek C. Noel. We invite your questions, observations, or words of encouragement by visiting our website, perfectpeacebaptistchurch.org, or by our email, which is Pastor Noel at perfectpeacebaptistchurch.org. We are a listener-supported ministry. Please support us with whatever the Holy Spirit places on your heart by going to our website, perfectpeacebaptistchurch.org. Now, prepare to go deeper into the Word of God with Pastor Derek C. Noel.